Um, welcome, uh, Dr. Julian Bergeron. Um, and thank you very much for spending some time with us on our uh, on our spotlight talks. Um, now, you haven't been at King's uh, very long, so perhaps you might start by just telling us a little bit about your own background uh, and, of course, the areas that you're uh, particularly and normally interested in in your research capacity. Yes, absolutely. So, so you're right. I, I effectively joined King's uh, in January this year. Uh, but I should say it's it's very much so a return to King's because I actually did my undergrad and PhD at King's College. Uh, and so so it was very much me coming back to my roots, I have to say. And it's it's something that that uh, was definitely a pretty, a pretty strong appeal for me to come back. Um, and so so my, my background, so I'm a structural biologist. So so what we do is, is solve protein structures. And, and in particular, in recent years, there's a technology called cryo-EM that ha has sort of taken the world of structural biology by storm. And this is an area that we started, um, or that I started working on it as a postdoc. And so I, my, my lab uses primarily cryo-EM uh, for structural biology uh, methods. And so, so the, the, the timing of my return to King's was basically when I was approached by the head of um, of the, the, the department, uh, the biophysics department, who was trying to set up uh, a cryo-EM sort of a capacity at King's and, and Matthias Gautel approached me and, and asked me if I was potentially interested in, in coming back. And of course, that was a, a very, a very appealing opportunity for me to, to come back to my roots, basically, and my alma mater. And, well, well, I, 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 that's I understand that uh, very much, and I'm pleased to hear that you have uh, wished to come back. But of course, you hadn't, I would imagine, intended on coming back to find yourself working on a particular virus, a coronavirus that's caused underlying this pandemic. So, what has drawn you into the, this area of, of research? Yes, yeah, so I, I mean, absolutely. So, my my lab works essentially on two. Well, on, on a range of problems, but basically the, the, one of the central theme is host pathogen interactions. Uh, and we work a lot on, on bacteria and how bacteria cause disease. Uh, and also, and that was also a big, a, big, a big appeal to come back to King's, I've had a long-standing collaboration with the Department of Infectious Diseases at King's uh, to look at how viruses interact with their hosts. And so all the, all the work that we have been working on uh, mostly with, with Mike Malin in infectious diseases, was on HIV and looking at uh, various proteins and seeing how uh, they, they interact with their host, they hijack. With the pandemic sort of coming up in, in the past couple of uh, weeks and months now, uh, it was an obvious, an obvious decision that we made to try to see how we can sort of gather this, this knowledge and this expertise and try to use it towards the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So what are the key uh, elements of the work you're doing presently? And you've mentioned, of course, this technique of cryo-EM, electron microscopy, but um, which, which, which structure is it you're seeking to resolve and uh, what would be distinctive of this? Because um, I'm, we're, we're, we're aware that structures have been developed out of uh, China and other locations. So uh, just a feel for what's distinctive and, and how you're going to get there and perhaps the people you're working with as well. Right. So, so one of the, 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 the main target that we're working on on, on the, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, is a protein called uh, ORF10. Uh, and this protein is particularly interesting because it's the only protein that is found in SARS-CoV-2 and not in SARS-CoV-1. And so we think it's quite important in the reason why we have such a pandemic while SARS, while it was very deadly, it was very limited in, in time and in, and in scope. And so we think that one of the possible reasons why this, this SARS-CoV-2 is so, is so problematic is because it has this extra protein. So that's one of the, the reasons that we're interested in. The other is because we have data from, from uh, people in, in the US, in San Francisco, that have shown that this protein of 10 recruits a, a complex, a, a human set of protein complexes that are called the ubiquitin ligase complex. And that, again, was very interesting for us because some of the work we had been doing with Mike Malim is looking at an HIV protein called VIF that recruits the same ubiquitin ligase complex. And so we already had a lot of the reagents that we needed to try to characterize this complex, a lot of the, the expertise uh, and, and the know-how. So really, I think it puts us in a, in a very strong position where we can jump in 
and we can sort of um, sort of uh, kickstart this research sort of quite quite rapidly. Now, um, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, EM still requires you to crystallize the uh, uh, proteins that you're seeking to get the structure of. Is that correct? No. So actually, the, the one of the great advantage of, of cryo-EM is that you do not need to crystallize proteins. And that, for, for structural studies for 30, 40 years, the, the gold standard was X-ray crystallography, where you need to crystallize proteins. And the challenge is for things like big complexes, such as these ubiquity ligase complexes. These are very difficult, and you cannot predict whether you will be able to or not. And so that was a, a huge problem. And so with, with cryo-EM now, of course, there's still a lot of challenges, but at least we do not have this sort of hard block of, of forming uh, protein crystals. And so that, that definitely is something, and this is why it's taken structural biology by storm in, in the past three, four years, is because we can just skip that, that block. And um, a feel for the progress you're making? Are you feeling confident you're going to get, get structural resolution in a relatively short time frame? And perhaps through that, just to give an indication of how that information will then be used, uh, perhaps particularly thinking of ways in which we might treat or, or at least uh, ameliorate the uh, nature of this condition. So the, the, the progress is, is still, so we, we started working on this only a couple of weeks ago, once we identified that, that this protein of 10 formed that, that complex. Uh, and so we, we're starting to making the components, we're trying to reconstitute the complex biochemically at this point. We are, we're not yet at the stage where we're trying to put it on the microscope, uh, but we're hoping that this should come within, within a couple of weeks, uh, really. Um, so, so that's in, in terms of the, the progress on the structural analysis. So in terms of therapeutics, I think this is this is a, a project that will not be on the short for the short game. Uh, I think effectively for the current pandemic to stop, we will need a vaccine. Basically, this will be the realistic, realistic way to, to make it go away. And this so this project will not go there. I think what we're working towards is more the long term prospect. So. First of all, is this going to turn into something that is seasonal, that comes back every year, where the vaccines will stop working? So in this case, we will, we will need to develop sort of long-term strategies to develop new drugs, new therapeutic aspects. So this is one of the areas that we will uh, sort of try to push towards. And the other aspect is, of course, if, you know, this virus has managed to evolve this capacity um, to cause this, this terrible disease through this protein of 10, it's absolutely possible that other viruses might develop it again through alternative strategies. And so if we can understand how this of 10 protein is involved in the virulence uh, of, of SARS-CoV-2, then we can actually, you know, potentially in the future get, get a step ahead of, of the next pandemic that might be caused by a different, different virus. And just to finish, um, I wonder whether you wanted to just offer some reflections on what you feel uh, the overall, or perhaps some outstanding aspects of the response King's College London has had uh, to uh, the pandemic itself. I, I, I so my, my my vision is of course a, a bit limited because I don't I I do not see all the activity that's going on behind the scene, uh, and and I mean I think everybody will will acknowledge that this pandemic has taken everybody pretty much by surprise. And it's such a huge disruption that, that it's, it's just very, very difficult to deal with. And we're still trying to set up all the teaching aspects, all the research activities, how to deal with this. We don't know how long the shutdown will continue. So all these are extremely challenging. Um, the the one, one aspect is obviously because I just moved from, from a different institution, so I see the differences. And one thing that struck me with, with King's is that very rapidly, there was this call for, for research funding towards uh, towards coronavirus research, and that's something that I, to me, was was I would say almost a, a feeling that that we were contributing as a university. We're not passive actors within a pandemic and within a shutdown, but we're trying to step up and be leading actors to try to fight it by you know each with our little means, with our long-term research, short-term clinical aspects, etc. We're part of a community that is trying to do what we can. Uh, to to fight this this pandemic, and so I think as a, as a scientist and as a researcher, it was it was a very good feeling. Just this very simple idea. 
Well, uh, Dr. Julian Bergeron, uh, may I thank you for spending some time with us. Can I thank you also for the work you and your colleagues are undertaking? Uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing more uh, about the progress over the next weeks and months ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard.